I think we can go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I'm Linda Grand. I'm a program manager of the City of Palo Alto. So I manage the city's water conservation program. Super excited to hold this landscape design webinar tonight with Juanita. Um, this webinar is partnership with Bosca. So just to do a little bit of housekeeping, I know we've all used Zoom, but as you can tell, all attendees are muted by default. Um, we're actually gonna do most of our questions at the end, but feel free to put them in the chat. You will have at the end, be able to raise your hand as well, and we can unmute you for you to ask Juanita your question directly. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available on the BASCA website. So a little bit of background about BASCA. So BASCA represents 26 agencies that include cities, water districts, um, a water company and a university, all that purchase water from San Francisco. BASCA member agencies provide water to 1.8 million people and over 40,000 businesses. And BASCA's goal is high quality supply of water at a fair price. So Bosca is really focusing on outdoor water use because it's the most single untapped opportunity for water conservation in the Bay Area. Um, this landscape program will help really promote outdoor use of efficient plants and innovative techniques. So if you live in um, the Bosca area, you Bosca works with several utilities on different rebates. So definitely um, go to your BOSCA website and utilities website, but some of the programs that BOSCA offers is a Lawn Be Gone program. This is a rebate program of $1 to $4 per square foot of lawn replaced. There's also a rain barrel rebate program. In addition, BOSCA has a Rachio smart controller rebate program and an optional rain garden rebate program. If you live in Palo Alto, we actually partner with Valley Water on our rebate program. So similar, but slightly different. So we have a landscape conversion rebate program, which we just recently increased the amount. So you can now get up to $4 per square foot for replacing your lawn with drought tolerant plants. We have a $400 laundry to landscape rebate program. We also offer rebates for rain barrels and cisterns. So as you're thinking about your drought tolerant landscape design, apply for a lawn conversion rebate. Um, this is, we have several upcoming webinars. Um, as you can see, I highlighted the Palo Alto webinar that's gonna be in two weeks on November 1st, where we need to actually gonna dive into even more detail of how to do a lawn conversion. So um, this will be, today's webinar is kind of a get started with design. And then in two weeks, we'll dive into even more detail on sheet mulching, irrigation, and more. Um, the city is also holding a community workshop for our One Water Plan. So this plan is looking at our water supply, conservation, and long-term planning effort for the city. So that will be on December 6th at 5.30. That's a vir hybrid virtual air in person. So please go to our website, cityofpaloalto.org slash workshop to sign up for these and then go to BASCA's website for the other um, Zoom BASCA classes. Um, there's also resources on Valley Water's webpage, watersavings.org, and you can find lots of good gardening resources at bayareagardening.org. So now I'm going to um, introduce Juanita. So Juanita has a PhD in biopsychology as well as a Bachelor of Science in Landscape Architecture. In 2009, she established Juanita Salisbury Landscape Architecture after working for commercial and residential design firms. She has recently turned her focus to California native plant pollinator habitats and in 2016 established the Primrose Way Pollinator Garden, the first of five pollinator habitat gardens in Palo Alto. 
The gardens combine her educational background, the bio biology and behavior of food intake with design expression born from landscape architecture. Her focus is to research and educate about these habitats, as well as exploring opportunities to install more of them. Uh, when you go, let you take it from here. Thanks very much, Linda. Right. All right. All right. Well, good evening, everybody. Thanks for uh, showing up tonight. Um, today, we're going to talk about Design 101, how to get started, or as I like to say, how can we put uh, four years of landscape architecture into a, a less than an hour long talk. Um, <clears throat> so I'm going to give you kind of like the, the best nuggets of things that will help you in your efforts to design uh, your gardens and your land outdoor landscape. Um, you can follow me on social media where we have a Facebook and Instagram pages, Primrose Way Pollinator Garden. We also have a YouTube channel, Primrose Way. And we also have a website. If you don't like social media, check out primrosewaypollinatorgarden.com. Also a great way to um, message me if you're interested in volunteering. Uh, because uh, I have five public gardens that I take care of here in Palo Alto. And these gardens are always open. Um, they feature California native plants, so I'm going to talk a lot about those tonight, and you'll be able to see what these look like when they're just planted, as well as when they've been in the ground for a few years. And this is Embarcadero Road here. The Primrose Way Garden was the first garden, and then we have the Island Drive Garden, Arcadia Place, Hopkins Avenue, and then the Gwenda Street uh, Pollinator Garden. And so I encourage people to go out and have a look at those. Um, you know, go several times a year to see how things look in spring, winter, summer, and fall, uh, just to get an idea of what the plants look like, what their forms are, what their colors are. And if you like them, that'll help you with your decisions. So the overview for tonight, we're gonna talk about planning your design. We're gonna talk about measurement and placement. I'm going to talk about planting, plant function, and some design tips. Talk about propagation, which is a great way to save money, maintenance issues, and then some final thoughts. So let's put on our design hats. As a designer, how do designers work? So the kind of the guiding principles for me as a designer, I follow the uh, form follows function path. And basically ask yourself for your space, what do you want to do in your space? What are your goals? So think about the functions that you want in your space. Do you want your outdoor space to accommodate your dining activities? Do you want spaces that are going to be for relaxing? Do you want edible plants and trees, vegetable garden? Do you need a place to exercise? Do you need a place to do sports activities? Do you like to entertain? Do you need a dog run? Do you like to cook outside? Storage, all of these are functions that you have to plan a space for. Um, and then consider what your style is. Do you like to do, <clears throat> to use formal versus or an informal style? Um, do you like a traditional style? Do you like modern, contemporary, and so forth? So <clears throat> ask yourself before you start, you know, what do you want to do? Okay, really, you know, spend a lot of time dreaming up the list of things that you want to accomplish. Um, I always tell people dream big, get that uh, it's free, and you can go from there. So also in your spaces, what do you want to experience in your space? Do you want to be in the cool, shady parts of your yard, reading a book? maybe having a, a beverage? Do you want to have some warm, sunny spots um, to really soak that sun up into your bones? Or do you want a quiet retreat? You know, what, what is the feeling that you want to have there? Um, that's a very important consideration in, in terms of, you know, deciding what kind of time you want to spend out there. That's the quality of the space. 
It's how you feel in the space. So use function-based decision-making, um, you know, and so ask yourself, what are lawns used for? Again, use, use, use. What are you going to, how are you going to use a space? And so you really want to consider installing one of these lawns here um, because outdoor irrigation, as Linda mentioned, accounts for most of a home's water use and the lawn can use up to half of the outdoor use of water. So it really sucks up a lot of uh, water. And as you can see, uh, there's one little girl running on the lawn, whereas everybody else is over on the patio around the fire pit and the fountain and so forth. And we know that lawns, you know, they if you mow them intensively, it increases weeds and lawn pests and stuff. So again, you know, what's the function? You know, do you need it to accomplish all of your goals? So the first nugget of goodness here is drawing a map to scale. This I cannot stress the importance of enough. You have to have a good map of your space. If you have a good map and it's drawn to scale, and I'll tell you what that means in a second, that means that you can, you can estimate quantities very accurately. Okay, you'll know how many square feet you have You'll know how many lineal feet you have of like fence line and so forth. And so whenever I go out to measure, I like to use graph paper because one square can equal one foot. And here's the scale part. If one of those squares equals like an eighth of an inch, then your scale will be one eighth of an inch equals one foot. If the square is a quarter inch, then your scale is a quarter inch equals one foot. That's what we mean by two scale. And so this is an actual, an actual measurement of a client's house that I did. And this darker line here represents the house um, with the doors and the windows and the sliders and everything. And what I do is I take out one of those rolling tapes and I, I impale the end at one end and then I pull it across the whole entire length of the yard. Um, and I try to, to get as, parallel to the surface of the house as possible. That way I know it's straight. And then I take measurements off of that tape. So the house from zero, a little arrow pointing the direction that the tape is in, over to nine feet, six inches. That's where the corner of the house is there. And then you just measure everything going forward on the, the line there. I take a second tape out and then following along the line of the house, I pull it in the opposite direction, giving me the depth of the yard. And I can move that tape to the other side and do the same thing. Using graph paper makes it a lot easier because it's an instant check. It's almost like a, a measurement check as you're doing it. If your measurements are off, it's not gonna look right on the paper. Things will be all skewed off to a corner and you'll say, hmm, that didn't work out. So take your time when you're measuring your site, you want to get it right. And it's, you, for me, it's always a lot of work to do this. This is why I usually use a, a service to do this for, for me now, um, because it's not a good, it's not a good use of my time at, at my uh, hourly rate. So, um, and when you're doing this, you want to take inventory of everything. You want to know where the downspouts are. You want to know the trees, where they are edges of your lawn, your hardscape that's existing. Hardscape is things like patios, steps, fences, walls, sidewalks, stepping stones, things like that. You want to know where the utilities are, where the electrical boxes are, where the outlets are, where your overhead lights are. Um, you want to know where the fences are, um, any sort of uh, buildings, any sort of notable features. Um, and then of course, which way is north? So you know which way, where the sun comes up and where it sets. So again, when you're measuring with your, for your landscape plan, this is a picture here of um, me measuring the Island Drive garden many years ago now uh, with uh, my, what they call the soft tape uh, because it reels up and it's pretty soft. It's made of cloth. Um, and I, pull those tapes and I leave them until I'm done. 
that way, you know, nothing changes. If you move your tapes around, uh, things might get a little askew. But I notice where utilities are. So we have electrical, we have uh, uh, vaults here where other things are. We have irrigation controllers and whatnot. Um, things, you know, again, in your yard, you want to notice like, is there a change in elevation? Okay, so is your lawn, is your area flat? Um, you know, are they, they're just really sad looking shrubs, you know, everything like that. So you want to, you want to make note of what's existing in your space. And again, note where the downspouts are, because water in the environment is what we're always talking about uh, in these talks. So an unconnected downspout where this does not go into the storm sewer presents an opportunity to direct that water back into the landscape. So again, make a note of everything that's there. Once you're done with that map, and what I've done here is I've just taken a piece of this translucent um, tracing paper. And I, you can see underneath maybe a little bit there where my markings are. I've laid over another piece of tracing paper. And this is where the thoughts start going and the design process begins. Um, I just generally show those functional areas for activities and then movement between those areas because you have to get from point function A to function B. So those become pathways. You know, so like I said, this is four years of landscape architecture all in one. So here's the house again here. Here's the doors that swing open. So this becomes quite the node uh, for getting out of the house. There's a slider here, so that's also an exit. So we have to get from here and then around the garden. We wanted to do some dining. We wanted to do some cooking. Um, we needed to screen a bad view over here. Uh, the client wanted a fire pit. So what it, this is called is a site-based functional diagram where you have functional areas and then you have movement between areas. And also you have, oh, there's a good view in this skinny little corridor here um, that we're gonna try to take advantage of. So, you know, it's easy to design things on paper. Um, I should say it was easy for me, but it's also almost inexpensively cheap and free because you haven't bought any plants yet. You haven't bought any soil or any hardscape. You haven't installed anything. It's just a dream at this point. So dream on the paper and move things around. Um, one of the things that here's, and here's a design tip. Um, so whenever you're designing things, decide on a form that works best for your situation. So this is the design part that I like to call the composition. Because basically your design is a composition. If it doesn't look good on paper, it probably is not gonna look good outside. Um, and so, you know, consider the relationships between your forms, your shapes. So what kinds of shapes do you have? You've got squares, you've got rectangles, you've got circles, you've got arcs, you've got angles, okay? And consider what the relationships are between those. And what we mean by relationships is how do they line up with each other? How do they relate to each other? And this is how you take your design to the professional looking level where things actually relate to each other because they're connected somehow and that generates a harmonious composition. So if you use like a circle and you come off and line it up with a tangent off the circle to the edge of a rectangular shape, that's how you relate a circular element to a square element. There are other ways to do it. That's just one way. Okay, so it's, it's, it's art essentially. So um, use arcs and tangents. You want to avoid these random curves that kind of, and I see this all the time, it is a beginner's mistake where people just kind of like draw the squiggle. Avoid the squiggle. <laughs> Squiggles are just don't look good. Um, so use a regular, a regular arc that has a radius point because then you can, when you're, if you want to lay it out yourself, then you can pop a piece of twine in the ground, anchor one end, and then you have an arc at the other end and you can draw out the arc of that, um, that shape, okay? 
Um, you can do things that are symmetrical. And symmetry is a great way to use or a great design element to use if you want something that looks more formal. Symmetry is very formal. Okay, it works really great on entrances because symmetry forms a nice entrance mode. Okay, another, another design tip. Um, you can repeat elements to harmonize. So you could do maybe a big arc and then some little arcs off to the side or whatever, you know, little circles, big circles. When you repeat elements, but maybe at a different scale, large, medium, and small, that's how you get some harmony. Okay, that's and that's how design works. That's the rule. One of the rules of uh, getting a harmonious design. Okay, so for this particular um, client, so I once I decided where the functions were, I decided on the form. Okay, the form that worked best for this client because they wanted something super modern was a very squared off, you know, rectangular, squarish sort of design. It worked great. So we had steps coming down. You can see we still have our, and then I just put the trace paper right on the top here. Um, and you can see we created spaces, okay, that will accommodate these functions. And um, so these shaped areas are the forms. And then once you have the hardscape done first, you always want to design that first because what that leaves you with, the places that aren't hardscape, are planting spaces. And in those planting spaces, first things first, pop those trees in, okay? And you wanna show them very generally. So this actually did get built um, at one point, but um, you can see that it's, it's very slowly starting to take shape and there's a place for everything to happen here. Um, and then another piece of trace paper went over the top of this where we started to figure in uh, showing shrubs in masses like this. Okay, these bigger, darker circles here drawn with a big Sharpie and then some smaller perennial masses. So we get a general sense of like big things, medium things and small things. So if you work in a hierarchy like that, it's like one, two, three, three steps. Um, and so when you have furniture outside too, and this is a, an example of drawing to scale here, we were uh, using quarter scale uh, graph paper here. You can see there's a one fourth inch. And we measured the furniture that was gonna go in the space. And we knew that it would fit um, into these places because we knew the dimensions. And once you have your proper base map and you know where everything is, how big everything is, you can just like move things around on paper. Paper, that's the cheapest thing to do is to move things around on paper. Once you start construction, it's really expensive. So you want to get it right on paper first. Okay, so you continue to refine your areas using additional measurements for furniture's pathways and so forth. Okay, so, but how do you lay out the plants? Um, so very generally, um, in a planting area, you want to leave some room for maintenance purposes. You want to be able to get in there and weed and do other things. And so in planting areas, I like to leave like a two foot wide pathway. And this could be a very informal area that's just not planted. Um, and then what you do is you add plants from your plant palette. And we're going to talk about how to select those plants in a minute um, as circles at their mature diameter. So if you look up that one plant gets to be eight feet you know, uh, when it's mature, you draw an eight foot wide circle and you place it. So do the large ones first, and then you can start layering in your shrubs and your perennials. And what, what things do uh, like pathways is they create edges. Another design tip here. Edges are a great design feature because then you can plant a mass along them and it just reinforces that edge. And edges are something that designers use to draw your eye. And edges can be formed by differences in color and texture so that you can direct your eye into a certain uh, place. Um, and so when you're laying out the plants as circles at their mature diameter, um, those circles should overlap a little bit or just touch a little bit. And that way, what you get then is an accurate 
count of plants based on your very accurate base map. So you see why I was stressing about that base map being accurate. Everything else will be accurate. If you have an inaccurate map to start with, everything else that follows after that, if it's not accurate at the beginning, will be incorrect. <laughs> so if you have to pay somebody to draw a map for you, it's worth it. It saves you money in the long run. Okay, so let's talk about the sequence of choosing plants. And we can talk when we talk about the sequence and we can talk about what plants for each of those sequences. And here's our Gwenda Street Garden. If you uh, travel down Embarcadero Road, you probably maybe have seen this across, almost across, directly across from the uh, Rinconada Park near to the new fire station with our nice sign here. Um, you can see here's our pathways and forming some structure along the pathways. And did your eyes go to this mass of plants forming a line along the pathway? Um, you know, so you want to start in a sequence. You choose your trees and you fit in as many of those as possible. Then you do your shrub layer. And the shrubs should compose over 60% of all your all of your plants. And to keep maintenance down um, and keep the garden looking lush and green all the time, focus on evergreen shrubs, uh, those things that don't lose their leaves all at once. Um, if you like that lush look, if you don't like the dried up, you know, I lost all my leaves because there's a drought look, go for something that's evergreen. And then over time, don't feel like you have to plant everything all the first year. I'm still adding plants to this garden and it's been in for several years. So I'm always adding things, um, things like grasses, perennials, bulbs, succulents, ground covers and vines because there's so much to choose from. And you wanna aim for a mix of herbaceous and woody perennials. And then it's planting season now. Um, we wanna plant, I said during late fall and winter, that's usually when it's the best time, but our soils have started to cool down quite a bit because it's cold at night now and um, cooler during the day. And it, it helps with the plant's roots to establish if the soil is nice and cool because they're not struggling in hot, dry soil to establish. If you can choose smaller plant sizes in four inch pots or one gallons, and trust me on this one, plant as small as possible because when you're digging holes, hundreds of them, the smaller the hole, the happier you'll be, especially if you're, you know, digging hundreds of holes. So a four inch pot is much easier than a five gallon or 15 gallon pot. Seeds are even easier. <laughs> so and I'm always looking for ways to do it easier and with as little work as possible because there's a lot of gardens to take care of. Um, and so if I can minimize my work, um, I do. And so I'm passing these, these tips along to you. When plants are first planted, I like to try to protect them um, with a physical barrier, like with chicken wire, baskets, or something like that to protect those small plants. Because the squirrels, they're notorious for digging things up, pop them right out of the ground the next day. <laughs> they do that all the time. So I protect things with wire baskets or chicken wire. Uh, until the plants can get established. All right, I'm exclu an exclusively California native plant person. Um, and what I'm delivering to you tonight is the best things that I know what to do as a landscape designer. So if you want to do the landscape correctly, plant native. California is a biodiversity hotspot. There's only about 30 on the planet that are hotspots like this. In California, we have almost 8,000 species of plants, some found nowhere else on the planet and more than any other state in the United States. We have many species that are drought tolerant. Hey, they, they've lived in California for millennia. They're used to dry conditions, some of them. We have lots of species of native bees that move the genes around and make better plants for us more than any other state in the United States. Um, across the United States, there's 4,000 bee species. Um, honeybees are not native, we're not gonna talk about those. But as you'll see, when we're designing, it's not so much, it's all important to make a good base map, to make 
good hardscape spaces to really capture a nice view. But when we're planting, this is also a design process too. We want to design the things that are going to be the most resilient, give you the most bang for the buck, and also to um, be the best garden that you can possibly design. And so uh, California natives are the way to go. Um, why is that? So here's the science part. And everything that I do as a designer is guided by science. And so um, plants are the primary producers of food. Okay, They take energy from the sun, and I call this my photons to protein slide. So energy from the sun, the leaves convert those to food for other things to eat. That's what they call plants are the first food level or the first trophic level. And so other things eat those plants like this caterpillar here. And then other things eat those caterpillars, mostly baby birds. This is how we get more birds in the environment as we plant native because as a rule, native insects only eat the native plants that they evolved with. And this is important as a designer because I mean, when you're planting things, you know, what's the point of a garden? You know, you think about everything. And remember I talked about form following function. It's all about what things do. What is their actual function in the environment? The actual function of plants is to be food. I mean, their plants are pretty decorative. They smell nice, um, but they're food. And so when you plant natives, and this is all part of understanding this as a designer, there's always more, there's always layers of like decision-making here. What this means is that your garden will attract many native pollinators and in turn uh, insects, and then in turn birds. And so in terms of sustaining life, uh, these native plants are critical parts of that. And so the plants, because we're also talking about moisture, native plants pass their moisture to other organisms. And those other organisms store moisture in their tissues. So um, we talk about rain barrels. Well, uh, we have biological rain barrels, although at a smaller scale, um, and these turn into butterflies. So, you know, it's like all these different decisions that you're making. How can you make the best design decisions? And that goes for what you plant. Why is it important to see native plants as food? When you plant these plants, your garden will attract a variety of native pollinators and other insects. So you want to avoid making the garden an ecological trap. So it's not so much to plant something like, oh, I planted a tree, I saved the planet. There's, you know, again, everything is connected. So you have to think about the ramifications. What does it mean to plant the tree? Um, and an ecological trap is something in the environment that attracts organisms like native plants. And because of that attraction makes it easier for them to be killed through predation or other means. So you want the animals, the insects that are attracted to your native garden to be able to, to, can, to basically finish their life cycles. You don't want them to die off after they've been attracted. You want them to be able to reproduce, lay eggs, nest, do all the things that these creatures do. And so, uh, you know, again, what, how, do you, how do you achieve like the best thing here with these native gardens? So again, you know, we talked about trees and shrubs and perennials. And so what you're doing is creating a lot of connectivity and complexity with these different layers. And the more that you have things connected, the more and the more complex they are, the more the plants support each other. So it's like, you know, design on steroids when you think about a plant community. Um, and in terms of saving water, less water use doesn't necessarily mean less plants. In fact, it may be that the more that we're adding plants and building a community of plants and other organisms that share water and other nutrients and information, um, you, you get a really very resilient community because they're very connected. And even if you lose a couple of things, you still have a lot of resiliency in these habitats, these gardens. And so with the right community of plants, 
the garden becomes a self-assembling living system that basically just about takes care of itself. Okay, you do have some inputs to it, but the plants will kind of work out where they want to go. And, um, you know, the roots will grow towards moisture, whether it's underneath piles of leaves. Um, like here, roots, the roots will send out runners. Um, they, things will grow in a, a rain garden or a swale. Um, you can trap moisture under rocks. Rocks are great um, for doing that. And leaves under trees trap moisture um, underneath uh, uh, the, larger, uh, the larger plant material. I'm going to talk about leaves, but leaves are super important as well. So anyway, so a goal here is to start with a minimum of 20 different native plant species local to the area. You're probably going, oh my God, this seems very complicated. It really, if you take it step by step and don't like feel like you have to do everything all at once and just take one step at a time, eventually you end up with this amazing looking garden that is full of life and uses very little water. So what is a plant community? And so from the vegetation glossary at the California Native Plant Society website, a group of plant species living together and linked together by their effects on one another and the responses to the environment they share, typically the plant species that co-occur in a plant community show a definite association or affinity with each other. So as a designer, you wanna pick species that play well together. We don't like to think about this or maybe you know, maybe you do like to think about it, but, or maybe we just don't think about it, but plants are social creatures, okay? They don't, they don't talk like we do. They have their own communication forms, but they are social. They do communicate things back and forth. We just don't see it because we're not privy to the chemical communications that they have. And they also move at different time scales than we do. So, um, but they do, they, they are, aware of each other. So then you say, okay, all right, Juanita, native plants, I'm down with that. Where do I find native plants? And so my go-to place, and I have a reason why I call this my go-to spot for native plants, is a website. It's a database that's done by the California Native Plant Society uh, called Calscape. And it's a database that provides information and resources. You can find nurseries for these plants. So you can click on a plant, see what nursery has it, click on that nursery's website, see if they have it in their inventory and go get it. And that way you can create your plant palette. And so Calscape provides uh, a planting guide, which is like a big how-to thing, uh, which is very useful, nurseries. You can create Excel spreadsheets um, and, Butterflies, what's that about? So let's just see, because I'm all about biology as a designer. Instead of what to plant, uh, maybe a better question is who to feed. Remember those caterpillars are full of liquid. And if you wanna keep liquid in the environment, liquid that's in the tissues of the plants, you know, and things are going to be eating those things. So keeping, you know, the moisture in the food web, um, ask yourself, what are the animals that are going to be eating your plants? And we know that biology is a super powerful force in keeping and maintaining uh, life and keeping uh, things alive. Um, as well as other factors like abiotic factors like climate, geology, and water. But if you really think about, you know, you're dealing with a lot of biology here as a designer. And so um, why not consider the functional design? You know, how do you want to use these plants? And so um, here in Palo Alto, as I mentioned, <laughs> I take care of a lot of public gardens um, that I design and you know, installed and all that. In Santa Clara County, we have 87 species of butterflies and moths. This is from the Calscape website, where they talk about butterflies and their host plants. These are the butterflies I have seen in Palo Alto. And this is only a, a, a handful of the ones that I've seen. Look how beautiful these are. As a designer, 
you know, I want to create beauty. I want to do the gardens right. And if you want to bring beauty into your garden, plant the plants that these insects will eat. Um, I tell you, when I saw this pipe vine swallowtail this year, I whipped out my phone to get a picture of it as fast as I could. Unbelievable. But I know that that particular caterpillar only eats the uh, Aristolochia, the pipe vine vine. And so um, that's the only thing it eats. So I know that that plant is around. I have a couple in my home garden. Um, and so if you have that plant, you will have these. So when you see these butterflies, you know that the plants that they eat are close by because that's all they eat. And so the plants have to be there. And so things like uh, this white skipper here, this was over at the Hopkins Avenue garden, was eating the Malacothamnus fremontii that I have planted over there. And that's one of their preferred sources of food. In fact, it was about two feet away from it. What a beautiful creature. I'd never seen it until this year. And we planted that plant a couple of years ago. So even if things don't show up right away, they eventually do show up. You plant it, they will come. So again, what to plant? You know, always as a designer, I'm always looking for the best ways to make a decision because with eight, almost 8,000 species of native plants here in California, you can get overwhelmed. So best ways to make decisions is to start with keystone plant genera. Keystone plants are the ones that form the backbone of habitat resources, food, shelter, and nesting sites. So if you imagine a keystone arch, that that arch in the middle, that stone in the middle of the arch, if you pull it out, the whole arch falls down. So those keystone plants provide food for dozens or hundreds of types of caterpillar species upon which countless other animals depend. So this technique to make a decision, if you have a choice between something that feeds five species versus something that feeds 50 species, choose the one that is connected to more things. You know, really everything being equal, but let's say you have a shrub, okay, this is all evergreen, it's about the right size, it's about the same water. How do I decide? I like both of them. Choose the one that's going to feed more species because that is going to be connected to a lot more things um, and will make your garden more resilient and use less water. Start with those keystone trees. Um, trees, trees, trees. Trees help save water. Um, they absorb water, release it into the air, cool it and cleaning it. They form half the rain cycle. They team up with oceans. They help circulate air or water across the land. Without deserts, without trees, deserts can form. They improve water quality by filtering rainwater and they slow down the impacts of heavy rain. They reduce flooding and stabilize soil. And that's not all they do. They do so much more. Uh, they increase the value of real estate. They, um, they provide food for lots of organisms. So uh, trees, trees are good. And um, clouds form more often over forested than non-forested areas. So again, you know, when you're designing, choose your trees first. You're probably going, oh, what trees work for you, Juanita? Well, here we go. <laughs> what trees can I fit in my yard um, that are you low water use? So I like to experiment with a lot of different things. Um, and these are the dozen examples from my tiny, tiny yard. I, and I cram in a lot of plants in the yard. I'm always adding things because I'm obsessed with plants. Um, and even that I've been adding more plants in last year, I'm still using less water than we did last summer. Um, and so some of the things that we have, um, I have Acer macrophyllum. Circocarpus betuloides, one of my favorites. Easy, easy, easy evergreen to grow. I even have a willow that I water by hand uh, because it's a huge keystone species and it's worth it for me to have one that I water by hand. Um, the elderberry, Prunus alicifolia, super nice, super low water use. Acer negundo, um, lots of different reasons for using that one. Uh, Hadermeles arbutifolia, the toyon. I've never watered this plant. <laughs> so really easy to take care of. Uh, Circus oxen talus underneath a 
wire basket here to protect it from the squirrels, Arctostaphyla glauca, the big berry manzanita, Prunus virginiana, Corylus cornuta. If you like hazelnuts, get a couple of these because um, you need a male and a female. And then we have our street tree. These are the native trees that we have. We also have a couple of apple trees. We have uh, a mulberry tree, and we also have an orange tree, so we have, and we also have a plum tree. So we have a lot of trees in our tiny yard. And there still might be room for more. Um, then you're adding your shrubs. Again, um, in Santa Clara County, 29 species that are native. And these are shrubs in my own home garden. You know, I like that lush look. I like to like have as little work as possible in the garden. Um, and so my relationship with plants, it's like, you know, are you gonna live or aren't you gonna live? If you're gonna live and you can stay, if you're gonna be a diva, forget it. I don't wanna like, like have to like cluck over plants. And so these plants that I'm showing you are super easy. Some are not super local like this Ribes viburnifolium. This is a Channel Island plant, I believe. Um, still does well here. You know, um, I have a lot of super local things that grow here, but I'm supplementing with a lot more because I like to experiment. But I mean, look how nice and glossy that leaf is. And I grew that from a seed. So uh, lots of lots of choices uh, for, for shrubs. Um, you want to add perennials. And so um, I do a lot of macro photography. So I'm always interested to see who's feeding on what. And in Santa Clara County, we have 53 species of uh, perennials that are native. Uh, one is Scrofularia californica, the so-called figwort. Um, beautiful, uh, comes, it has two flavors of colors, the red and the green uh, flowers. The red ones are kind of cool looking, super attractive to big fat bumblebees. And also Facilia californica, super uh, easy to grow, reseeds itself, bumblebees love it. And then one of the best ways to keep water in your garden is to use succulents. These are like my, one of my favorite things to do um, is to use succulents. They have a very interesting mechanism for how they save water in their tissues. I won't go into it, but the word succulent comes from the Latin word succus, meaning juice or sap. And so they're juicy, okay? So they're gonna have moisture. And you're, this is a great way if you don't want to, if you don't have room for a water, rain barrel, get a bunch of succulents because they can really store like a lot of moisture. And there's so many different, different uh, succulent things to choose from. Cactus, Lewisia, agaves, sedums, crassula, leptocynes, dudleyas, one of my favorites, and even bulbs because bulbs are juicy as well. Okay, here's some native uh, brodeas that we have there. So lots of ways to make it really complex. And we have 188 succulent species native to California. So lots to choose from. Um, as I mentioned, Dudleys are my favorites. They are so easy to grow. I mean, look at this one growing on a vertical rock face. Okay, if you want low maintenance, you know, and that's one of the design decisions that I make. Clients always ask me, I don't want to take care of it. How can I like do less? And it's like succulents, um, super easy to grow. Um, Dudley is here's they come in a couple of deep, different leaf forms. They have like the finger form. Um, this one's Dudley virens hassii at two different times of year. Some are like the flatter leaves. They uh, this is one of the ways that they go dormant as they uh, dry out a little bit and then they puff up as soon as the rains start kind of cool looking. Um, and you can add lots of, you can mix and match them with other plants. So here's a, a really good design tip here. Um, so for that lush look, because we want things to look juicy, um, if you don't like that desert look, um, use succulents that don't go as dormant um, next to something that's dark and evergreen. So here's a sedum growing next to an Arctostaphylus. Look how pretty this combination is. This is growing out in the wild. Uh, there are other things growing here, like a wild rose, um, some kind of a cedar tree here. And a design tip, if you contrast dark and light foliage like this, you create year-round visual interest. 
So yet another design tip. And um, if you want edible plants, so it's like, again, what are your goals? Do you want things that you can eat? And I love to kind of, you know, just kind of nibble on things when I'm outside. And the, the native strawberry has these little berries, but they taste like candy. They're delicious. Our native huckleberry, super easy to grow and super delicious blueberry flavor. Um, another design tip, you can have a single plant here as a focal point if you want something like this is a ceanothus. This is at the uh, Gwenda Street Garden where um, it just forms this really beautiful uh, blue ball. It's a ceanothus valley violet, one of my favorites. Blooms early in the year, like January, February. Um, super good for bumblebees. Smells good and it just you know, creates like a, a seasonal focal point. So it's not all year round, but it does like, you know, provides that succession of color, okay, amongst the other plants that are there. Um, if you wanted to go with a monochrome design uh, theme. So here we have um, a couple of slightly different shades of green, but they vary in uh, texture a little bit and scale. So it's very harmonious. So here we have, this is Claytonia perfoliata, which is an annual coming up underneath of, I don't know what this is exactly, but what a great combination. This is, I think at uh, Foothill Park Preserve. Um, this is over at the Island Drive Garden. Um, if you like cool colors, the blues, the greens, the purples, um, you can get some very beautiful contrast with something like Penstemon heterophyllus next to that malacathamnus that makes that white butterfly um, and creates something beautiful to look at. You know, this plant looks good most of the time. It uh, tends to spread by runners, so you want to give it a lot of space. Um, okay, so you're thinking, how am I going to afford all these plants? I ask this question all the time. Um, and so I like to propagate things from seeds. And these are actual seeds of one of our bulbs, the Fritillaria. This is a pink flowering one. And I'm not afraid to grow something from seed that will take seven years to bloom, but <laughs> you probably wanna start, um, you know, if you're in your twenties doing this kind of thing. So propagation, growing things from seed is very affordable and super cheap. And also raising things from seed preserves genetic diversity. And well, I do what is called the cold moist stratification. A lot of seeds will break dormancy if you give them some moisture and you put them in the fridge in a, um, a plastic bag. I usually wet down a coffee filter with a label on it in indelible ink saying what's inside the coffee filter that's wetted down, stick it in a plastic bag, put it in the crisper drawer, check it every couple of days to see if a root tip has emerged from the seed. I think this is a uh, one of our native delphiniums, uh, delphinium perii. And when I saw that root tip come out, that means it was time to plant it. Um, again, you know, there are lots of different ways to propagate. Um, some some uh, succulents you can grow by cuttings, like the sedums. Others, like the dudleyas. Some dudleyas you can grow from cuttings. Others you grow from seed. And so... If you really want to save money, buy one plant and then collect the seeds from that one plant and you will end up with like a thousand seedlings, just saying it can turn into a cottage industry here. And so this is the Dudley Ahasii. Remember that picture I showed you with the finger shaped leaves? These are her babies. This is one pot out of about a dozen. So I've got maybe a thousand seedlings of these plants. Super easy to grow. Um, so, you know, nature pays us back in abundance. Okay, so once it's designed, you know, your, your keystone shrubs are in, you say, okay, how do I take care of it? Because remember, we're forming this self-assembling living machine. It's less work than a non-native garden with a lawn. You don't have to mow it. You don't have to water it as much. Basically, until things are established, keep those weeds at bay. You want to irrigate the plants to establish them about once a week. 
irrigation should encourage the roots to search for water. So I water deeply just outside the root ball, prune sparingly to control dried up and dead material for fire safety. Uh, you don't have to fertilize. You don't have to amend the soil really very much. I usually mulch to control the weeds initially and to help establish the plants. And then once that mulch kind of gets eaten down by the earthworms and stuff, then I let leaves fall and stay there because um, leaves are ecosystem gold. You know, they have all the nutrients that the plants build up over the year. We don't want to take those away. It's like, hey, I, want, I need those to eat for next year so I can make more leaves. Um, again, you know, working it in to let things complete those life cycles. Um, some people don't like the way that leaves look uh, in a garden, so you can tidy things up with a skim coat of bark chips. And it, you know, it looks like you've got a thick layer, but get that consistent look with like one chip thick layer. Um, you can leave bare areas of dirt for, for bees to nest in. 70% um, of our native bees nest underground, so um, they will nest in your yard. You will have a, a bee nest. And I've never been stung, and I spent a lot of time photographing these creatures right up in their faces, so um, they're really not interested in stinging. They're not aggressive like honeybees are. Uh, don't lose, use leaf blowers in the planted areas. Let the leaves fall where they may. Leaf blowers to get things off of the hardscape, the patios, the driveways and stuff. Um, you know, use an electrically powered one, of course, because that's the law. Um, and then try to reduce as much gas powered equipment as possible because of the fumes that are created. You don't need pesticides, herbicides or fungicides. Remember, self-assembling, living machine, once you've got all your design pieces in place, um, you don't want to interfere with that sort of like the garden's like, okay, I got it from here. I can take over. That's your goal as a designer. You can hear your garden say that to you. You're not crazy. You're just a good designer. Irrigation. Some rules of thumb here. Um, you know, plant during the fall, winter, or spring when the soil is cool, plant small. A water one to two times weekly, just outside the root ball. Um, roots will seek moisture. They will actually, I mean, plants are so interesting in what they can actually sense. Plants will actually grow towards the sound of water. <laughs> Who knew? Um, they're mysterious creatures. Um, you know, you want to research the amount of water use that the plants use. Very high. Uh, medium, low, very low, um, and decide, okay, do I, do I want to go with like super low water use? You can choose those plants. And the next slide actually shows you where to find that information. Um, once established, water is recommended. Um, underground drip may be suitable for native plants that grow normally in seeps. Remember that CalScape page that I told you about? The planting guide has a lot of great recommendations on how to irrigate native plants. Okay, you don't want to water during the hot temperatures because you don't want warm, moist soil that can encourage the growth of pathogens. So it's like, you know, design includes taking care of things, you know, keeping it something looking good. It's not something like a piece of art that's static. Remember what you're designing is dynamic. It's alive, it's changing. So you have to develop this relationship with it because it's developing relationships with everything else. And because you designed it, you're connected to it. So again, refer to that CalScape California Native Plant Gardening Guide for more in-depth information. And as promised, how can you find out how much water plants use? So handy website, um, Wuckles, the Water Use Classification of Landscape Species, it's a database that basically ranks plants as a percentage of turf grass. So turf grass is 100% of water use. And then everything from very low is a percentage of that. So very low is 0 to 10%, low is 20 to 30%, medium 40 to 60%, high 70 to 100%. So you can look to see which plants fall into which categories. So again, another decision point. You know, if you really want to go with all very low water uses, you have these tools now in your toolbox 
for making these good design decisions. Again, avoid creating an ecological trap. I'm not gonna go into depth about this particular slide. One of the best things that you can do to, you know, once you have this living thing as, you're, as a designer, you want it to like, you know, take care of itself. And so what you can do is to reduce light pollution at night. Um, you know, we can have moths come to windows that don't have blackout curtains. Um, and you can lose up to 60% of insect species um, in, a, in a trap like a light, outside light at night because they're eaten by other things or they just become exhausted and die. So obviously not able to complete their life cycle. And you will, when you plant native, you will have these in your yard. It's a guarantee. Um, and then leave those leaves in, in place. Final thoughts. So four years of landscape architecture condensed down and then biology and functional decision-making to be the best designer you can be. So among the other ecosystem services and saving money on water and maintenance, the more that you understand these interrelationships in nature, you will learn more how to optimize the productivity of your native garden, leading to an abundance of life, as well as an enhancement of your appreciation and role in caring for nature's complex beauty. And you will be an amazing designer. And with that, I'm happy to take any sort of questions. Yes, thank you so much, Manita. Um, we have a couple questions in the chat. Feel free to add um, in the Q&A, feel free to add some more. Also feel free to raise your hand. I'm gonna go through those questions in just one minute. We are planning future landscape workshops. So please fill out our survey on how you felt this class went, what topics you wanna to see in the future. I did put it in the chat and we'll be sending a follow-up email as well, but that will really help us plan for giving you the best information going forward. All right, so let's see, we got a lot of good questions. We have a question actually on planting strips or medians? How do you ensure that the pollinators are not in harm's way from high-speed cars? You know, that's something that, um, that really concerned me. And so, um, because, you know, the Embarcadero Road Pollinator Corridor Project is in one of those strips. The, the section that we're doing is nice and wide. It's about nine feet wide. What I've discovered is that bees will nest very close by to uh, those plants that they use for food. Um, I mean, it's literally like 10 feet. So they're probably not going to cross the road uh, to get to the other side. If there's something good for them right there, they literally will not go any further than they have to. So one of the best things that you can do is if you're planting that medium strip, also plant up your front yard. So their direction is away from the road. Another thing about um, these insects is that they experience the air much differently than we do. It's kind of almost like water for them because of their, their mass and their size, the way that they move through it. Um, and so, um, you know, people are supposed to go 25 miles an hour. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a good chance that they'll be blown away before they're smacked on a windshield because most of the, the smacking comes at high speeds and hopefully in this town um, people are going the speed limit um, so you can only do so much um, and I try not to mic micromanage too much what the insects are doing but I try to direct them away from things that might be um, harmful to them so if you can provide something that's more attractive than the road um, that's one, one way to keep them out of harm's way. Um, but it's probably worse to plant nothing, thinking that they're going to be killed. There's only so much you can do, but to do nothing is actually kind of worse, especially if you don't, um, you know, if you don't have all of these other behaviors that are tools in the toolbox so that the design can, you know, as a designer, you know, you're creating this living system and you want it to function. Um, as designed, 
And so you do what you can. There are some things that are out of our control. So, you know, what are those things that you can control? So you can try to attract them with even better things further away from the road. Um, and also talk your neighbors into doing it too. So shame your neighbors into planting up their strip. Maybe the next neighbor down and so on and so forth will do that. Um, and that way you give them better resources so that they don't have to cross the road. Great, thank you. And those park strips are eligible for the landscape rebate. Right, $4 great. a square foot. <laughs> yes. Um, we have a great question about maximizing trees. So in a smaller site, like a backyard, how would you balance maximizing trees, but um, making sure that it doesn't have too much shade, so there's, there's enough sun for other plants and edibles? Right, so it's all about the planning um, in knowing where the, the north arrow is pointing so you know where your sunny spots are and your shady spots. Um, and in your, in your design, you want to, um, you know, if you wanted to maximize where to have sunny spots, so you wouldn't do a lot of tall things on the south side, um, things that were perhaps evergreen because south, south, east and west sort of plants are going to be um, blocking the sun, especially as it, it's a lower angle coming in, um, unless that's your goal. You know, so you just have to sort of analyze your site to see where you want to preserve the sunny spots. Um, you know, and if you want to have more sun during maybe winter months, you can plan for deciduous trees instead. So you have control over those things. It's just deciding on those trees that will help you achieve those goals. So evergreen, south versus north, um, deciduous versus not, and just finding those best spots. Remember, you want to you want to plan those functions first, and then find those things that help fulfill those functions for those uh, for those decisions. Great. We have a question about building up healthy soil. How can you start to build up soil so you can plant in it? Um, Megan said that she has a dry dirt path that is mostly remnants of an old lawn. Right. Um, so what I like to tell people is um, use leaves. <laughs> leaves are great. Um, if you have any sort of trees blowing leaves onto your property, um, you know, you want to have as many of those as possible. Um, leaves are generally free. Um, and if you see your neighbors like bagging up leaves or their gardeners bagging up leaves and getting rid of them, you know, ask if you can take them. Um, you can actually get compost uh, over at Eleanor Party Park um, and spread a nice thin layer of that, maybe an inch thick um, on your soil. Uh, that's a, you know, that's free. Here in Palo Alto, we got free compost. Um, so I've used that occasionally. Um, I use it very minimally, but native plants are not, they're not like, they don't really need a lot of soil amendments. They actually kind of like lean, sort of not very fertile soil, because what will happen when you plant into them um, is that they will start generating, you know, leaf debris and other things, and that builds up the soil. And um, what you may notice, and so in some of my other talks, people say, well, how do I know when my garden's getting established? One of the things that you can do is to look for the presence of uh, ectomycorrhizal fungus, okay? So uh, if you see like these brown lumpy mushrooms coming out of the ground, that's probably what, it, what they call bohemian truffle, um, which is one of these mycorrhiza, um, which is a fungus that grows underground, wraps around the roots of plants, takes minerals out of the soil and trades for carbohydrates with the plants. So you can actually, um, if you, you know, if you see one of these mushrooms coming up, usually in a native plant garden, we have them coming up in all of ours. Um, there's, there's that affinity again going on. Um, we take those, those mushrooms and sprinkle the spores into our planting holes uh, because we almost never amend anything. 
we do mulch when we first plant to help, you know, just establish things. And there's free mulch in this town as well. So I wouldn't worry so much about amending the soil because really the native plants, they just don't need it. <laughs> so, and we do have free amendments if you want it to work in a little bit, but it's really almost not necessary unless you have like, you know, like chunks of concrete and construction debris, those things you don't want in the soil. But if you have native soil, you know, you really almost don't have to do anything to it. Great. We have another question on trees. Do you have recommendations for evergreen trees that do not lift up the pavement and also do not um, cause pollen allergies? Um, so, you know, um, are you looking for an, was it an evergreen or a deciduous tree? Uh, they said evergreen tree. Evergreen. Um, so one that I like uh, a lot is the uh, Prunus alicifolia. And uh, I like it because, um, you know, it's super low water use. And um, it, the pollen of these particular plants, um, so the things that cause pollen allergies are the, the plants that are wind pollinated, that kick out pollen indiscriminately and it floats on the wind and it's not moved around by insects. So the things that flower like Prunus are pollinated by insects. The insects are moving around the pollen. They don't count on the wind to pollinate them. Um, and so, I mean, that's how a lot of flowering plants are is that they, like 90% of flowering plants depend on pollinators to move it around. Um, and so that would be a good one. Um, another one that I really like is uh, Circo Carpus betuloides, the mountain mahogany. Um, you know, again, it's pollinated by insects. And so it's not gonna be spewing out masses of uh, pollen. So things that are not wind that are not wind pollinated, like those plants, will definitely work. Um, maybe even something like um, it's another good one. Even the toyon, you know, again, um, those flowers get converted into berries very quickly. So the pollen is not really a big a big issue with that uh, because the flowers are super attractive to pollinators. So um, the pollen dries up pretty fast because there's all kinds of insects on them, looking for nectar, looking for that pollen meal for their offspring. Um, so those are three that I would try. Um, and just, it depends on, you know, what's gonna be uh, your aesthetic preference. You know, what's the, the best keystone species for your, your preferences. Um, you can also try maybe an Arctostaphylus, a big shrub type that gets really tall. That actually has a tubular flower, does not kick out much pollen at all. Those are mostly pollinated by long tongue bumblebees. Um, so, and they flower in the winter time. So not a lot of, not a lot of pollen flying around. Great. Um, we have a question on how to work with HOAs to encourage drought friendly lawns. Do you have any suggestions of kind of how to bring that up with the HOA board? Um, so get yourself elected to the HOA board so you can make those decisions. That's one of the ways. Um, and, you know, um, if your HOA board is looking for cost saving measures, you can, um, you know, come to my next webinar where I talk about how much water a lawn uses exactly because I have calculated the numbers. Um, and you can say, okay, this is using, you know, 100,000 gallons of water and it's costing X. This will cost us a tenth as much, you know, and, um, you know, we can get it transformed at $4 a square foot. So, um, <laughs> you know, make them an offer they can't refuse. There's lots of different ways to sort of um, get people to agree. Um, you know, and when you're trying to have these conversations with people, you can lead them to a conclusion that they make so that they sort of own the decision. Be like, 
you know, oh, we could do this. And you'll be like, yeah, isn't that a great idea? God, you had that great idea, you know? And so, um, you know, get the conversation started, um, you know, maybe start in a small place and say, you know, we can try maybe as a test plot to do this, however you can get them to do it, you know, whether it means like voting everybody off the board and, you know, getting a new board in place. Um, you know, sometimes you, you know, to make a changes, you have to step up and that's how things happen. But, you know, um, you know, keep trying. That's the best, you know, persistence is usually pays off in, in the long run. All right. We have a question about leaves. Aaron asks, when you say not to remove weeds, is that don't ever remove them or only at certain times of the year? So you can leave them or they fall. Um, so people get worried about their plants getting buried and they may get buried for a little while and you can brush you know, leaves off into the planting beds, um, but leaves decompose. So they won't bury your plants forever. I mean, if you have a really heavy leaf fall, you can brush plant, you can brush most of the leaves off and just leave the rest. Um, there's absolutely no reason to remove them. Those leaves are the nutrients that the plant spent all year generating, you know, making these leaves. They're not just waste material, they are nutrients. And the plant needs to eat those <laughs> to be healthy. Um, so, you know, pe some people don't like the way it looks, you know, it's untidy. You know, do the camouflage of the one chip thick method um, of bark, bark chips, super cheap to do. Um, but, you know, clean it off a of hardscape, you know, your walkways and your driveways, probably not very useful there. But when I tell people to leave the leaves, leaves are ecosystem gold. Um, absorbs water like a sponge. All kinds of amphibians live in leaf litter. All kinds of larva, pupa, um, caterpillars live in leaf litter. In fact, most insects spend their time, most of their lives as larva or pupa. The adult lifespan is really short. And so if you remove the leaves, you're removing all that life. You know, you're removing nutrients and leaves encourage fungal decomposition those mycorrhiza, they love to eat leaves. You know, they love to like move along a leaf layer under, I like to call it the lasagna layer. So what I do is I leave the leaves and then do a thin chip, one chip thick layer. And so the mycorrhiza actually grows along that flat surface of leaves underneath. I kind of think it prefers to grow in a planar surface like that rather than three dimensional, a theory. Um, like I said, it's just less work. Just leave the leaves, you know, just like, you know, that's how you save moisture. That's how the plants stay healthy. Um, that's, you know, all those organisms that are little bags of liquid for birds to eat, they're, that's where they live. And so why would you remove something from where they live? You know, you leave, leave the leaves. You have my permission. Great. <laughs> Great. We have a question about sycamore trees. Um, this resident says that they have a sycamore tree and they dump a lot of leaves that don't compost. They're at, looking for plants that are easy to grow under sycamores and don't trap a lot of leaves so it's easier to take care of. So, um, you know, that that's a great question and that comes up a lot of, you know, the sycamore leaves are quite large and, you know, so what you can do is, you know, go out after the big leaf fall and just brush things off with a broom um, and just pick the leaves out or have your gardeners pick the leaves out. Um, and things that grow well under sycamores, you know, the I love an Arctostaphylus um, or a Ceanothus underneath um, sycamores. Um, Arctostaphylus, depending on the variety, they can be very dense. So can trap, root, uh, trap those leaves on the top. Um, they don't really fall into the interior so much, but those leaves do break down and they do, they do drop through. So, you know, what I tell people is be patient because nature will take care of it for you. 
um, these things will decompose. You just, you know, a lot of people like it to be clean and tidy instantly. That's not really how these, that's not really how these life systems work. So, you know, things take time. You know, it's not a static thing. It's a dynamic thing. And sometimes leaf decomposition is a very slow process, but that's the time scale that we're dealing with here. You know, again, that's another one of these pieces of information in our information toolbox that we use to decide. But <clears throat> for things that don't trap leaves, so Arctostaphylus and Ceanothus, depending on the variety, those are a couple of good ones. We have a question about planning. Do you have to completely map out and install the irrigation system all up front? It's generally easier to install an irrigation system before you plant because Otherwise, you're trying as you're digging up, you know, places for your your limes to run. You're trying not to step on things, and you know, after planting, so many gardens, everybody steps on plants. <laughs> everybody steps on them. So, plant after. Great. We have a couple questions going back to the map slide. Um, one of them is recommendations for representing slopes. And yes. then as you're thinking about the, when you talked about those random curves, can you give an example of random curves that they should avoid? Yes. So, um, so how to represent um, a slope on a map is a difficult thing. Um, and, you know, that's, that's a real map maker kind of thing because you can show it by showing changes in elevations with contour lines. So you can create a topographic map um, where you can show like all of those places on the ground that are at the same level designated with a line, like say it's 100 feet further down the slope, it's 98 feet and so on and so forth. You probably have seen those kinds of maps on like uh, USGS, you, uh, the geological survey topo maps. That's how you represent a slope. But on a map that you do yourself, you don't really need to do that. It's, it's not exactly the correct way to do it, but you can just lay a, a line along that slope, uh, a measuring tape along that. It gives you the same distances and everything else. It's just not a topo map per se, but it, it still gives you a, a relatively accurate um, representation to work with, even though it may not look like your property. Like say, if you have a big slope like this, you know, and so you measure that out. But if you were doing a topo map, which looks at things directly like this, your map will be longer than, than a topo map, which looks at things straight down. So for a homeowner's purposes, um, you can just lay a line out along the ground. If you wanted a topo map, I would hire a surveyor to do that because they have those that equipment where they can like measure changes in elevation, do all that like complicated stuff. Um, so, and then the other question was, what was that again? The example of random curves to avoid. So, um, so random curves, if I could uh, draw one would be kind of like a squiggle where you have like a lot of weird small arcs and big arcs and small ones that, they don't really have any sort of relationship to anything else, or it's like a really shallow curve where you can't really see, you know, like, is there a curve there? So it's like, it's where it's either not distinct or it's like too many different curves thrown in there. Um, you know, so that would be another thing to do. I mean, so when you're, when you're designing something, you want to think about like how does this when you're doing it on paper how would you translate that out into the environment so when 
you give up like a designer or a installer your picture, they will know where the beginning and the end of the curve is based on where the radius point is. So that they can draw it and recreate it. And if you have sort of a random thing like this, where you don't really know what where the, the mid, the, the center point of your arc is, and it's just kind of like random, they aren't going to be able to recreate what you have drawn on the ground because there are no points of reference. So you want to, you don't want to just kind of, you know, draw it out like that. You want to be more methodical about where your arc begins and where it ends and where it begins and where it ends, you know, and so that you can recreate those beautiful drawings, those beautiful arcs and curves on the ground. So that's what I mean by random, you know, don't just draw a squiggle and think it's going to look that exactly the same when you take it outside and go to install it. Because yeah, I tell you, you just, you have to be so specific with these things because when you lay things out outside, you have to have some point of reference so that you can draw an arc. You know, if it's like, um, you know, a six foot long arc, you know, you have to know where the beginning and ending points are. And the only way to do that is to know where that radius point is. Great. We have a couple questions about irrigation and native plants. I think we can kind of combine these two into one. Um, how important slash necessary do you need an irrigation system with native plants? I think we need to, you can talk a little bit about hand watering and what the water needs for these plants really are. You know, it really depends, I think, a lot on, you know, how big your yard is. So if you have like a 10,000 square foot um, yard, you know, hand watering is going to take a lot of your time and you'll have a really close relationship with those native plants, uh, probably take up a lot of your time. Um, and um, so at that at that point, irrigation becomes um, <clears throat> necessary to establish the plants. <clears throat> and so, um, you know, a, a drip system can help you establish things. And then once they're established, you can um, redo the irrigation schedule. So. I hope that answered the question. So I had to mute there for a cough. <laughs> yeah, I think that's good. I think I see one more question on any rules of thumb for using rocks or other moisture traps in your design. So I like to put rocks next to plants because um, it helps me not step on them. And when I water, I can actually direct the water to the top of the rock so it flows over the rock. Um, and it creates a cool spot next to the plant. So the plant's roots, you know, are gonna go underneath there. Um, and rocks are kind of like little mini habitats anyway. Rocks have lichens growing on them. Rocks have moss growing on them. Um, and things will grow underneath of, of rocks. Um, so, you know, be artistic with them, you know, kind of like place them to like, create some nice balance and symmetry or asymmetrical design elements. You know, there's nothing worse than a row of rocks just kind of lined up in a row. And it's just like, somebody got handy on the weekend. Um, you know, I mean, again, it's an aesthetic thing. So you could like maybe have like a couple of large rocks to one side and maybe a, a grouping of smaller rocks to kind of get, you know, like a sim asymmetrical symmetry going on where there's nice balance between these things. Um, but again, it's, you know, it's a personal preference. Um, I like to use decorative rocks and there are some great stone yards around here where you can go and you can select boulders of various sizes. They have like rocks that they call head size because <laughs> they are the size of your head. So you have like head size, twice head size, and so forth. Um, you can get boulders that can be quite decorative of different types of, uh, of materials and minerals. Um, you know, you can get 
some really pretty things and put them out. I have some sparkly quartz rocks here and there um, that are decorative and they are functional um, as well as, you know, providing uh, some visual interest. Great. I have one more question for you. Um, I actually had a resident come up to me the other day asking what ground covers for drought tolerant gardens you suggest to have play areas for kids and how to incorporate that in your garden. So uh, for play areas for kids, you know, it's gonna be really tough on the plants to have kids run around on them. Um, but you can, you know, if you, if you wanted a grassy area, we do have uh, native grasses that you can plant. And um, I'll cover this in my, my talk on replacing your lawn uh, on November 1st. But there's actually a company called Delta Bluegrass where they make native sod blends. And these native sod blends um, use only about a third as much water as a regular lawn. So they're pretty low water use. Um, and, you know, so you can have that and get that nice and established. And the roots of these uh, native grasses are quite deep. Um, so you can, you can do something like that. Um, you know, when you say play, what does that mean? What kind of play? Are we talking running around, bikes, skates, balls, dogs? You know, I mean, it's really hard. These, the, all these creatures are hard on plants. So a native grass blend might be the best option for that. Um, you know, if you have like more imaginative play, um, we don't really mind too much. So in my backyard, I've let the grass completely die and I just throw seeds that I collect from our various gardens out there for wildflowers that come up, do their thing for maybe three, four months out of the year. And then they die back, I trim them down. I don't really care what happens to them, you know? So maybe if you have like a wildflower meadow um, for kids to play in, depending, you know, if it's not like an imaginative play, you know, it really, you know, ask yourself, what's the function of the space? How tough do the plants need to be for what kinds of activities you're going to do there? Great. Um, okay, one or two minutes, if there's any other additional questions. I know that we still have 13 people online with us. Feel free to raise your hand or put a question in the Q&A. Megan is saying thanks, this was great. Thanks, Megan, hope to see you in two weeks at our lawn conversion webinar. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So thank you everyone for attending. As I mentioned, this is being recorded and will be posted on the BASA website. We will be sending a follow-up email with some of the links that Juanita um, mentioned in her presentation. And please join us in two weeks to learn more about converting your lawn. Have, uh, and please fill out our survey that's in the chat that will be in that email as well. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anita. Have a good night. You too.